Hi everybody, uh, welcome to this video looking at the end of the Cold War. The game really with this uh, tragic background of uh, a rough ceiling whilst the screen's down. Uh, hopefully it's just that I'm going to pull together kind of the end of the Cold War. This should supplement what you'll end up doing in the classroom. The idea is that when you're in the classroom you kind of basically go through the events. Now, um, the end of the Cold War is marked from 1985 until 1991. The course actually ends in 1991, and um, what I'm going to do is break it down into various different reasons why the Cold War ends. Uh, first reason why the Cold War ends is due to the arrival of new leaders and new policies, and I'll explain about those in a sec, so first let me outline the points. Second thing is economics. Um, 1980, uh, the economic situation in America and the USSR changes, and I'll explain that. That's the second point. Third point are the summits. So you did this in Dayton where they'd finally got together and talked to each other for the first time since the hotline face to face. Right. Now we have this, the four summits that help end the Cold War officially when they meet and, and start signing stuff. That was three. Four is the Eastern European rebellions. So um, there's a load of riots that kick off in Eastern Europe as a consequence of what's been going on through the economics and the new leaders and so on, because it all ties together at this stage. A bit like the origins of the Cold War is actually quite nice and straightforward. The end of the Cold War is also just as straightforward, really. Um, and then there are a series of events that happen with um, 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 with um, South America and Africa that I'll hopefully try and touch on as well. And that wraps up the South America and Africa stuff and Cuba stuff that you would have done for the for unit five. Okay, first of all, let's start off with new leaders and policies. So point number one about how the Cold War ends. In 1980, you have the um, voting in of Reagan in America, who is a hardline anti-communist, very much almost like going right back to the start of the Cold War. Uh, parallels you have with, um, with Truman, who replaces Roosevelt. Roosevelt can play off Stalin quite easily and note and has a relationship. Truman does not, is a hardline communist and there's friction and that's why the Grand Alliance falls apart at the end of the Second World War. Same thing's now going to apply with um, with Reagan. Reagan is a hardline anti-communist. He's very much into free market capitalism and neoliberalism, something similar to, to Margaret Thatcher in 1979. Coincidentally, Margaret Thatcher is elected as leader of Great Britain. Both of them share a synced up mindset in terms of how to deal with communism and both of them want to help end communism uh, and help end the Cold War rather than just end communism. It's the Cold War they want to end. So both of them come in as quite hardline leaders and we hadn't had that before in the 1970s during daytime. You've got quite softer American leaders like Jimmy Carter, who's only really kicked into gear um, the, the, um, um, when Carter has to start rearming in, in 79 as a consequence of Afghanistan which we'll come back to later on. So you've got these two new leaders in the West. Both of them start to rearm their countries and start to talk quite aggressively on the um, political scene. In 1983, you have what's... Um, well, in 1982, you have the death of uh, Brezhnev, who's been in charge from the 60s onwards. From 64 onwards, you have Brezhnev in power. Um, massive eyebrows guy. When Brezhnev dies, it then opens up the... Um, it, it opens up a kind of leadership contest and we have what's called a gerontocracy. I think geriatrics, old. A gerontocracy is a country that's run by um, just old leaders. And you have Andropov first in 82, who only lasts a few months in power and then dies in the job. And then you have Chernenko who takes over in 1983. During, um, uh, during this gerontocracy, the USSR is really falling behind. It's not adapting to its economy, whereas China in 1976 under Deng, Deng Xiaoping changes to a free market capitalist style. That's why China survives in the style it is. It's communist in name, but capitalist in its economy. The USSR doesn't make that change in the 70s, and as a consequence, its economy spirals to the, to the start of the 1980s. Now you get the um, now you get the position where. You've got two very old leaders in the USSR. They're quite, you know, they're not up to date. They're not really on it. One example of this is in 1993, you have KAL 007. It is a South Korean plane that is shot down by the um, Russians because they think it's a spy plane. And it causes this international uh, controversy, a little bit like when they shot, when the Russians shot down that uh, Malaysian airline plane that was flying over their territory very suspiciously a few years ago. So, you have these two new leaders, and then what happens in 1985 is you have Chinenko die, and then you, you end up with a leadership contest. 
The winner of that leadership contest is a guy called Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, Gorbachev has this birthmark on the top of his uh, of his head, which makes him quite, you know, stands out as quite a, a, a symbol for the USSR. And he's a softer guy. We don't know this at the time, but he's much more lenient. He looks at what's happened to the Soviet Union and he changes the direction of it. Just like Khrushchev did when Stalin died, Khrushchev took a slightly different, remember, peaceful coexistence was the idea that you could link... Um, you could accept the other person was there. Stalin basically ignored the West and basically said, no, they should be got rid of. Khrushchev accepted the West was there and basically believed that we could live, we could coexist, but we could still compete with each other. Gorbachev comes to power and he creates two brand new policies, Glasnost and Perestroika. Glasnost is the idea of being open. It's no, it's, the word is openness. And he said, the only way we're going to survive now is if we just have open with people about where we are. That openness was not only being open with your enemies and your allies and telling them the situation that was going on, but it was being um, open with society and allowing people to start to talk more freely, criticise the regime. Um, and that's going to be a problem. These two policies were designed to modernise the Soviet Union after several years of having an old person in charge. It was almost like it came at the right time. In the 1980s, people started to push boundaries a lot more in Europe and around the world culturally. And that had an impact when somebody in the Soviet Union started to relax a little bit more. A little bit like when the de-Stalinization thing came out in 1956. It meant that countries in Eastern Europe were like, ooh, maybe Khrushchev's not going to be that harsh. And that's when they rebelled there. That will have the same impact on Eastern Europe again. So glasnost was openness and perestroika means restructuring. And what that meant was that the Soviet Union was going to restructure their economy. And that has a whole kind of economic vibe, which rolls us in nicely, I suppose, to point two, economics. So the second point about why the Cold War ends is economics. In America, you've got Reagan and um, in Britain, you've got Thatcher, who are ramping money into the arms race because they're capitalist economies. They can do so. Uh, the Americans start to rearm. Uh, the Americans under uh, Reagan start to talk about something called the Strategic Defense Initiative, otherwise known as Star Wars, because the film had just come out in the 70s. Um, 77 is the first Star Wars. There you go, nerds. Um, Star Wars was this idea that you could have a satellite in space that could zap any missile that flies towards your country. And um, that became quite a, a, a kind of like selling point for the for the Americans when it came to discussions with the Soviet Union that they could do, do this. They still haven't developed the technology to do this. It was just a pipe dream. So economically, you've got the Americans who are, who are ramping things up. Um, and at the same time, you've got the, the, the Soviets who are crippling themselves with their state-led um, centralised economy, where you have these four-year plans where everyone kind of lies about the statistics. They're broken because they've been throwing money into weapons and not developing their their um, domestic markets. So there is no choice in supermarkets. Food is quite scarce. Um, they don't have, you know, they don't have big brands um, like the McDonald's brands or they don't, they don't have the ability to kind of allow people to freely do that. So you've got quite bland standard food. Um, and as a consequence of there being a lack of consumer goods, in fact, you know, TVs, computers, things that in the 1980s are now readily available in America. And because of detente because of the um, Helsinki um, port in 1975 there was now a share there was a sharing of um, science and technology and, and, and Russians for the first time could start to buy American goods so they've had an appetite now where they've been able to buy these things and they just can't afford them um, there's a funny thing in a TV show called Deutschland 83 where um, I'm, I'm fairly sure it's a true story one of the spies gets hold of a floppy disk from um, Western Germany, they bring it all the way back to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, the, the Soviet um, computer technicians look at the floppy disk. They have no idea what it is. They don't even have the, the things on the computer, so they can't even put the disk in their own drive. And, and that, hip, for me, epitomizes the economy of the Soviet Union. It is incredibly low. Stats, number of telephones, I've had to write this down, number of telephones in um, the USA in millions, you had something on the lines of 140 million telephones um, being sold in the 1980s to 10 million in the USSR. Uh, another stat, the number of computers in thousands, uh, so you have 170,000 being sold in the early 1980s in America, 10,000 being sold 
in the USSR. The gap is huge. As a consequence, that leads to people in the USSR being angry and wanting, and they actually get quite depressed. There's a huge upsell in vodka um, uh, because people just want to drink themselves into happiness or into oblivion. So there are major problems with drugs and there are major problems with um, alcohol in the Soviet Union as a consequence of those economic problems. But the Soviets are fighting a war in Afghanistan, hence why there needs to be an arms race. They now face America competing with them technologically and with an arms race there. So the Soviets are pumping money into weapons again, and they can't afford to do so. They couldn't afford to do it in the 70s, and they can't afford to do it in the 80s. Faced with these weaknesses, Gorbachev makes some drastic steps. And economically, what he does is he creates, um, through Goss plan, Goss plan was this um, Soviet organization that looked at regional economic planning. And he basically suspends it, collapses it, and says, do what you want. He opens up free market capitalism. But what he does is he calls it, uh, what's he call it? My gosh. Um, I think it calls it, calls it communist capitalism, communist capitalism. Communist capitalism. The idea behind it is that it's going to be capitalist in model, but communist in design. Sounds like capitalism, if I'm honest, with a lie. Um, however, what it was all about was um, the Soviets attempting to try and allow free market to, um, to emerge. So they, they got rid of the idea of targets. They allowed people to start to uh, trade openly in the idea of kickstarting the economy. And it was and it did have some success. Um, it did have some success. But as a consequence of the wars and as a consequence of um, being a little bit too late, it, it, it didn't have the effect that it needed to. On the same side of that, you've got um, social things happening. Gorbachev is relaxing censorship, so he's allowing people to be more critical of the regime. He's allowing um, companies to start charging different wages, which creates this sense of competition in industry, which is all very good. But it, it, again, it's a little bit too, too little too late. Um, the cost of these changes was quite large. The bureaucracy that was in place was actually corrupt. So that took a long time to kind of sort out and they just they were on the clock and they didn't have that time. So there's the second reason why it collapses economically. Kind of like point 2A, Eastern Europe is also feeling the bite with these um, economic issues. So if you go to places like um, Eastern Germany and you went to the supermarket, they've got like one brand of anything in there to buy and the shelves were empty. They'd have three or four cans in a, in a store because they, they were not getting, the, they weren't producing enough food. And because the Eastern European bloc was tied to the Soviet Union and it was the same systems, it also meant that they were, it was causing the same issues in Eastern bloc countries. And they were looking to the USSR to be like, help. And the USSR were trying to help. What would happen though, is there was corruption in terms of, there were certain shops, if you were a party member, where you could go and get much you know, more expensive food. So that corruption was already in place. And I suppose people were just getting more and more resentful um, at the time. Good. Leads us on to the summits. Number three, what happens in 1985 is, uh, in fact, in 1983, uh, which I think is the Return of the Jedi, that's um, Gorb um, Reagan makes his very famous speech in front of the Berlin Wall, where he says, um, and it's 83 where he calls Russia an evil empire, like Star Wars. He calls Russia an evil empire. Obviously, Gorbachev's in power in 85. And what Reagan does is he goes to the Berlin Wall in 1985 and he makes a speech about, tear down this wall, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And he talks about ending the Cold War. Gorbachev hates Reagan. Reagan hates Gorbachev. But what happens is in 1985, they meet at um, Geneva, which is in Europe, um, in Switzerland. And the whole idea is designed to get them talking. And it's a massive success media are there they talk openly for the first time about reducing weapons and the um the geneva conference in november 1985 is the first first real moment you actually see any genuine progress between the two they actually come out of it liking each other and that is huge it's the it's a real turn turning point moment where they realize they can actually do a deal here they actually like each other reagan never gets an actor we well, don't know this actually reagan's an actor so he's got a personality. And on top of that, you've also got the fact that, um, that Gorbachev is a much more kind of softer, more left leaning, um, obviously left wing is communist, but his slightly softer kind of approach means that the two hit it off really well. And at Geneva, not much is discussed, not much is actually agreed upon, but what they do talk about 
is the fact that they will commit to reducing nuclear weapons by 50%. So they talk about reducing nuclear weapons by 50%. Um, and they also agree that they will meet up again to discuss um, what's called the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, the INF. This is eventually signed in 1987, but they talk about these intermediate missiles that, um, not the intercontinental ones, the intermediate ones that can go from like one country to the other and hit them. They talk about actually cancelling and getting rid of them. It's a big talk, but again, it's all talk. Geneva. Second conference they then do is Reykjavik, and that is the following year, 1986. Reykjavik up in Iceland is the second conference, and the purpose is to put the US, Soviet, Soviet and um, um, American kind of um, communication back on track because it kind of faltered in the early 19, uh, in early 86. It's also faltered in 1986 because it's the same, it's earlier in that year when Chernobyl explodes. The Soviet Union tried to um, squash the, the what happened at Chernobyl. They try to um, dumb it down and they don't get any reports coming out. If you know the story of Chernobyl, there's a great TV series on Chernobyl. It, it's really the end of their economic designs. Their nuclear program is shown to be a big disaster. What happens is one of the safety measures they've got in place involves inserting a uran is inserting like a, a rod into the um, apparatus. The tip of the rod, though, is the thing that sets sparks the um, explosion, and it's the explosion that destroys the plant. When Chernobyl goes off, the Americans are incredibly angry that the Soviets have sat on it. The Soviets just about saved Chernobyl by pumping what they um, they pour concrete into the base of the reactor so that it doesn't hit the water table because if it hit the water table it has spread to the water of the world and killed us all. The cloud that came out from Chernobyl was so large that it swept across Europe. Uh, it was being picked up by Sweden and it's the Swedish who reported it to the world and said uh, Chernobyl's gone off. The whole world try and help them. The Russians do what the Russians have done for a while which is kind of try and do it themselves and um, they only just about avert nuclear Armageddon because it could have been a whole lot worse and they just managed to do it um, at, the, at the great sacrifice of hundreds of people who they um, basically rush onto the roof of the of the power plant to push all the radioactive material back into the reactor and they all die. So they sacrifice all these people to do so. Whole new story um, but that's what throws them off you see relations between the Americans and the Soviets. So at Reykjavik they talk about human rights, they talk about humanitarian issues and they also talk about this INF treaty which is signed in 1987. Reykjavik's good. Third one, the following year in December 1987, they agree to meet in their capital cities and Washington is the first one. Gorbachev signs the INF um, before this summit and when they get to the summit, it's all about bringing the arms race to an end, finally. Um, what is actually agreed? It's the first time that the USSR and the USA agree to remove a whole class of nuclear weapons, the intermediate ones, gone. It's significant because the Soviet Union makes no demands, they just agree to it, amazing. The USA have got this SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative Star Wars, and that is a sticking point because they won't discuss it with the Soviets and the Soviets are like, we're doing this, why can't you do that? Because Reagan wants to hold some power back. The Soviet Union also makes no demands that um, it should be able to retain 100 SS-20 missiles as a defense against China. Don't forget they fell out with China in the 60s. And lastly, the Soviet Union accepts that British and French nuclear weapons are not part of the deal. The Soviets give up a lot in the Washington conference. Um, by 1987, there's an agreement that, the, that Gorbachev is going to withdraw from Afghanistan. That's because economically they can't do it. And strategically, they are being beaten by the, F, the, the Taliban. Um, just the same as we and the Americans were beaten by the Taliban in the early 2000s. Washington summit is viewed as a huge success because there is something agreed. Um, and there is an optimism that there is going to be a reduction in nuclear weapons. We get the final conference, May, June 1988, Moscow. Um, this is where they try to talk about strategic arms reduction talks, actually reducing these intercontinental ballistic missiles. Um, it's Reagan's final year in office. He wants to kind of do something major. And so they actually agree to reduce um, these, these weapons. And they, they do so. They also talk about something called non-proliferation, the idea of other countries having them, like weirdly enough, the Ukraine had them. Imagine if they had them now. The Soviet Union basically took back all of the missiles or, or, would, or would make sure they took back all the missiles they had in other countries if it came out. Um, they are four conferences. Those summits helped pave the way for communication. And there's a good section at the end of your textbook, page 190 something, 
that um, goes over the details of those conferences. Right. So that's one, that's two, that's three. Let's go for the fourth one, which is Eastern European rebellions. Right. This is my favourite bit. Basically, as a result of Glasnost, it will start criticising the Soviet Union. What's the biggest thing that um, holds the Warsaw Pact together? The Brezhnev Doctrine, which says none of you are allowed to leave the, the, um, the uh, Warsaw Pact. What Gorbachev says is, eh, well, well, if you want to leave, you want to leave. It's up to you. Whoa, that's huge. He basically is not going to enforce any country to stay with them if they didn't want to. I mean, it's te I've, I've kind of condensed what he actually said. But the point was he created something that the Americans call the Sinatra Doctrine. It's a joke. Um, Frank Sinatra sang a, a song called My Way, which was suggesting that um, countries could do it their own way. They could leave the Soviet Union if they wanted to. So the Brezhnev Doctrine, eventually, it isn't officially, but the Americans call it the Sinatra Doctrine, that countries could choose to go their own way if they wanted to. First country to do so, Poland. Why? Polish Pope. 1979, at the same time that Thatcher's coming to power, a Polish Pope arrives in the Vatican. This is huge because religion doesn't exist in the communist society. As a result of the Pope being Polish, it means Catholicism gains foothold again in Poland, not that it went away. And the Poles, um, as a consequence, rally behind the Pope and Catholicism comes back hugely in Poland. And that's the first real sense of resistance. What had also not gone away was Solidarity, that organisation in the early 1970s, which had been around and then been squashed. It just went underground. It was a, a trade union movement that was sparked by protest in Gdansk, a shipyard that protested about paying conditions. Ironically, um, trade unions being banned by the Soviets is, is crazy because Soviets are literally trade unions. That's what they mean. Uh, anyway, so um, we now get to Poland. Poland, um, in 1981, the ban is lifted on solidarity. A guy called Vlek, um, um, no, uh, Volish, Vol Volchek, Volchek, Zawaleski, Volchek, oh yeah. Uh, he's the Polish prime minister. He's the Polish leader. He, uh, Zawaleski, allows solidarity to come back. And the guy that leads it is a guy called Lech Walesa. Lech Walesa will eventually lead the first successful democratic party in Poland. So Solidarity gains momentum and by 1989, Solidarity um, vies for elections. They're so powerful that the Soviet, Soviet government in charge of Poland basically allows them on the ticket to be voted in. It's supposed to be a power share. And what happens is the um, polls basically, um, it was supposed to be bicameral leadership, you know, two, two parties ruling. Everyone votes for solidarity. Everyone backs solidarity. As a consequence, what happens in Parliament is uh, there was a, some elections. Um, solidarity wins 92, I'm reading this, of the 100 Senate seats and 160 of the 161 seats in their Parliament. It's every seat by one goes to solidarity in the elections. It's a massive knock in the first country. And Poland becomes... Um, the first de de democracy. It transitions to a democracy. In 1948, it transitions into a one party state. And the irony is it then flips through through elections back into um, being a democracy. When Poland falls, it then creates a, a momentum. Hungary is the next country. In Hungary, what happens is there is a um, student protest. Yeah. So the guy, remember the Hungarian uprising? Um, it was, um, oh gosh, the chap, I've forgotten his name. The guy that was in charge of the Hungarian uprising, he is replaced by Kadar. Kadar. Kadar eventually is put under pressure by a group of students who want um, reform. They want reform in Hungary. And what happens is there's a great deal of pressure put on Hungary from um, East Germans who get to the Hungarian border. It's kind of like what happens is there are elections that are held in Hungary, pressure is put on Hungary and Hungary has an election. Um, those, free, these, those, those elections eventually lead to, again, um, communist parties being pushed out. And um, Hungary actually is a peaceful, tra it peacefully transitions into another country that um, moves away from communism. At the same time, at the same time, Eastern European, Eastern Germans are moving to Hungary and they're piling up on the border because Hungary is now a democracy. They're hoping that they can get through Hungary to Austria. If you remember the Austrian State Treaty of 1955, it meant that Austria could be its own free country. Soviets and the Americans agreed it and stayed out. 
Austria, therefore, has always been its own little independence country. Austria borders Germany. Austria borders Hungary. Austria was a window out to the west. Massive, massive caravans of people travel through a now free Hungary to the border with Hungary and Austria, and the Hungarians open the border. Now you've got a way of getting from East Germany through Hungary to Austria and then into Western Germany or the rest of the world. So it's happening, it's breaking. What then happens is in November 1989, um, the, there was an incident, you should, go, you should YouTube this, call, uh, look up the um, accidental opening of the Berlin Wall. There's a guy called uh, Eric Honecker who's in charge of East Germany. He's been in charge since the 1970s. He resigns because he, he, doesn't, he doesn't agree with the way that Gorbachev is um, running the Eastern Bloc and he's replaced by a guy called Egon Krenz. In, and that happens in 1989. In um, 1989, uh, so October he resigns, but in November, this, on November the 8th, 1989, famously the transport minister goes on TV because they've been told not to People have been gathering at the, at the border because they're hoping that they can get through. Just like they've been getting through on the Hungarian border, they're hoping that they can get to the East German checkpoint, which is the Berlin Wall, to get to the West. Um, it all happens during a press conference where they talk about travel permits and they try and ambiguously say, um, you, will allow to, you will be allowed to go to the West if you can get a permit. It, so it was the Soviets' way of, of, of mixing up the language so it made it look as though you couldn't actually... That you couldn't get out. Anyway, um, a, a journalist asks him, when can we leave? When, when, when do these rules come into effect? He shouldn't have said anything. He should have said eventually. But actually he says, now. These, these rules come into effect now. Basically, he just said that the, the wall doesn't exist and you could cross. At night, hundreds, if not thousands of people descend on the border. The guards all stand there with their guns. They stare at each other, don't know what to do. The order on the TV had been to let them through. And so they open the barriers and let people just move between the walls. It is an emotional moment. It's on the TV. People have got it with sledgehammers and they start smashing the wall. And the Berlin Wall falls down due to a mistake. But with the wall coming down, it's a symbol that Germany is now open. It's now open to talk to the West. Uh, since 1975, it's been closed. Now it's open. Now East Germany is recognising the West. That's it. You could argue, like at the start, the Cold War begins because of the Berlin Airlift. You could argue the Cold War end, uh, sorry, starts because of the Berlin airlift. You could argue the Berlin Wall and, and Germany ends the Cold War because symbolically it was the thing that started it. In the 1960s, they built the wall, which kind of like intensified it. And by 1989, it had fallen down. And the Berlin Wall falls down. It's not long until 1991 that the country's unified. In 1990, in fact, they unify in 1991. It all becomes legal. They do it really quickly and Germany becomes whole again. Right, um, we then come to you at 28 minutes. You want a couple more minutes of listening to me, really, uh, and then you're done. What really then happens is, uh, in terms of Europe, nothing, that's it. Soviet Union, it's the end. In 1991, there was a coup. Um, uh, Gorbachev allows Eastern European countries now, he's, he's let the rest of them go. Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, all of them break away. There is this massive movement where everyone holds hands uh, from Latvia down to Lithuania in a kind of show of solidarity. And again, all of these countries break away from the Soviet Union. So now it's not the Eastern Bloc countries, it's the USSR itself. Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Ukraine, um, they, they all um, vote to, to, to leave the USSR. When that starts to happen, the 22 countries of the USSR start to fragment. There is a coup in Russia, where uh, a guy eventually called um, oh, oh, brain, 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 um, Boris Yeltsin. Boris Yeltsin helps lead this coup. They arrest Gorbachev, put him under house arrest in his, uh, in his little bunker. They all drive, basically, it's a bloodless coup, a bit like how the whole Soviet Union started in the first place. They all rocked up, keys were handed to them and said, get on with it. Tanks arrived in Moscow. Um, the TV channels were all cut, communication was stopped and ballet was played all day, so not to arouse suspicion. Gorbachev basically signed over the Soviet Union and said, I will collapse the Soviet Union on Christmas Day, 1991. And it went. In 19, uh, January 1992, the Soviet Union woke up to be called the Russian Federation. Mm -hmm. the day. Yeltsin was eventually replaced by a guy called Vladimir Putin, and Putin still exists in power to this very day. Um, a final point in the last few minutes 
uh, last few seconds is to mention what happens in um, um, in uh, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Cuba. Basically, once the Soviet Union collapses in 1991, the Americans don't care, and they allow the Contras in um, Nicaragua to, to to they allow socialist governments to form. They stop supporting all the regimes elsewhere. Um, Cuba is allowed to kind of continue to do what Cuba does. Uh, El Salvador is left on its own. Nicaragua is the big one because the Americans have really crushed it and they basically allowed a, a kind of like pro-socialist government in. In El Salvador, um, the US um, engaged in negotiations and they allowed Latin America to kind of, to, to, to kind of do what it wanted. Same with the Cubans. In Angola, it was much more complicated than that because uh, it kind of led to a civil war. But um, there was an agreement reached where the MPLA would, would remain in power and people would stop fighting over it. Ethiopia, something similar happened there after the um, uh, invasion. What happened is the Ethiopian army um, was kind of allowed to get on with it. Marxism was allowed to continue there. Uh, and then the Cold War effectively ends at the Malta summit. Uh, where in 1991, the Soviet Union is dissolved. The new president at the time is a guy called uh, George Bush Sr. Uh, and that's it. They agree start one, strategic arms reduction talks, and start reducing the number of weapons they've got. And that is how the Cold War ended. Hope that was useful. Good luck with the rest of the revision. Bye.